Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Good day, panel members. Good day, the organizers of this program. It gives me immense pleasure to talk on a topic that I feel that is of crucial importance at this point in time in the geopolitical history of the world. But first and foremost, I must express my sincere gratitude to the organizers of this program, the International Webinar on Crisis of Security Challenges, a global concern organized by the Department of Defense and Strategic Studies, Tujaram Chutakan College, Pune, India. And I would like to thank you most preciously for thinking it wise to you know, bring up such an auspicious topic as we are discussing today. Greetings from Nigeria. Greetings from Novena University and greetings from the Department of Intelligence and Security Studies, Novena University, Nigeria. I am going to talk on the topic Indo-Pakistan geostrategy and implications for African security. I am interested in this topic because I know that as part and parcel of the Indo-Pacific geostrategy, and more especially when it comes to Indo-Pakistan geostrategy, a lot has to bother on security issues, and Africa experiences some aspect of ripple effects on the basis of what is happening in that region. That is why I felt that it is very, very important at this point in time to talk about this wonderful topic as we are looking at it today. First and foremost, it is needful for us to understand that Joe's strategy remains a sine qua non in the business of statecraft in any society, in any country whether developing or developed. The reason being that, in a nutshell, it gives every state the foundation and fundamentals of national security. In other words, Joe's strategy is predicated on some key assumptions, and those key assumptions are the things that we are going to be looking at subsequently. The world as we have it today is facing a very critical epoch. Threats coming from different aspects of human endeavor have continued to put pressure on global security. Scholars of Joe's strategy are no longer talking about you know, militarism and military manipulation as it were. You know, they've gone far beyond you know, global security threats, beyond the traditional military circles, you know, beyond the traditional you know, statecraft as we have, beyond having just a kind of bipolar struggle for global military domination. Uh, we have, uh, you know, ventured uh, right now into a lot of sentimental, you know, security forces that are pulling, you know, states all over the world uh, to the extent that the so-called um, you know, global military giants 
are really facing a lot of impregnable challenges. Beyond that, there are a lot of, you know, security threats, you know, coming from, you know, nations that were not that powerful in the last few decades, and to the epoch of non-state actors, you know, one need to also mention, you know, such threats coming from non-conventional military weapons, including what we are facing today as COVID-19 and the global pandemic arising from possible conspiratorial manipulations, you know, by some countries of this world, you know, to undo one another. I will go into detail subsequently, but we cannot talk about any contemporary issue today without mentioning the coronavirus, which has devastated the entire universe and is still devastating the world, and which will destroy the economy of the world for some decades to come. If you ask me much sincerely, I will tell you that whether we like it or not, it has remained a potent threat and will continue to be a potent threat and may not likely be the last one to come because it is obvious now that nations and indeed non-state actors can actually veer off into this aspect of biological weapon as part and parcel of their dual strategy. I am saying this because it is possible. I am saying this because I am of very strong, I'm of, of a very strong opinion that something close to that is happening in the world today. And if we are not careful, the theater of war will shift essentially from the conventional military aggression and military threats to that of manipulating microorganisms as weapons of warfare, weapons of mass destruction capable of destroying the human race. What am I trying to say? I am saying that the purview of geostrategy at the global level is expanding and the manipulation, genetic engineering and manipulation of microorganisms and viruses in particular will remain part and parcel of what we are going to be facing in the near future. The world, from the point of view of geostrategy, has to take care of that aspect because it is going to happen if it is not already happening. Now, talking about the main issue, as an African scholar and as a professor of intelligence and security studies, I have been very keen of the Indo-Pacific geostrategic realities, the role of China and the United States of America, the role of India and the enormous potentials of that country, and of course, the role of Pakistan, first and foremost, as a very large country by global standard, a possessor of nuclear warheads, and home to one of the most resilient terrorist organization, or better put, the Talibanization of that country for some time vis-a-vis -vis their frosty relationship with India over some political and geographical disagreement. I will also take some time to review America's interest 
in the Indo-Pacific region with regards to their vested interest and what their interests have created over time in Pakistan. And of course, what China is trying to do, you know, in Pakistan with regards to trying to, you know, check the growing, you know, relevance of India to their strategic interest. I need to say that researches have shown that by 2040, India is going to overtake the economy of the United States of America as the second largest economy and with a monstrous population of about 1.5 billion people. That places India as the potential second most important country after China. And that also places India as a very strong competitor and regulator of the expansionism of China in the region. So you can see from the geostrategic point of view that the rise of India is a serious geostrategic counterbalance to the People's Republic of China, and China definitely will not sit down to cross their legs and watch the omnibus growth and relevance of India. Having said that, I will not forget to state that America's interest in the Indo-Pacific region has a lot of strategic relevance. China has been one of the strongest competitors against the United States. And naturally, America will also be very interested in what happens in India as the largest democracy in the world. And to use India as a positive check to the excess expansionism of China in the region. So you can see that there are quite a lot of ding dong affair, you know, playing out in the region at the level of geostrategy, strategy with China trying as much as possible to manipulate Pakistan to serve as a reasonable check to India, and India trying to assert herself, taking into cognizance the potentials that India is trying to showcase. And of course, with America trying as much as possible to be friendly with India with a view to making India a potential check to Chinese aggression in the region. So part of what I will be talking about will be revolving around the United States of America, China, Pakistan, to some extent Australia, and those countries around the Pacific. Permit me to say, ladies and gentlemen, that we are going to do a lot of detour amongst these countries in the Indo-Pacific region of the world before I will finally dovetail into what is happening specifically between India and Pakistan and zero it into Africa and Nigeria. The Indo-Pacific region of this world is the largest geographical area of the world, housing about 65% of the entire population of this world. And I make bold to state that this region and India in particular may most likely shape the destiny of this world in the second half 
of the 21st century. This is because it is going to present an interesting theater of competition between India and China, the United States, Japan, and indeed Australia. The competition that is going to be thrown up from this region will actually go a long way to shape the socioeconomic destiny of this world by 2050. What am I trying to say? The bulk of the economic statecraft of the world by 2050 will be concentrated in the Indo-Pacific region and by the time you add such big countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, to the group of these countries, we should be talking about a region that will determine where the world will be heading to. Therefore, for India, which I'm going to be dwelling on after now, we are seeing a country that has a monstrous potential to check the excesses of China by her size and by her economic relevance. We are also seeing a country that China will try as much as possible to check using every possible ally in the region to try to check so that their own national and geostrategic interest will not be jeopardized. I am seen as a scholar from Africa that this region is going to present a dramatic political turn of events as nations will be in an endless struggle for socioeconomic, political, and military relevance. And that will throw up some interesting security challenges as we are going to be seeing in the decades to come. Having said that, I know for a fact that India, the world's largest democracy, is going to come out with some interesting geostrategic blueprints. And as a matter of fact, these blueprints are already on course. I am seeing an India with a geostrategic blueprint that will represent um, a zero-sum arrangement capable to present a platform to checkmate the Chinese position of a repressive vision of a new world order because India is going to present a unique Asian democratic platform that is capable to redefine statecraft on the basis of a transparent economic governance that will be based on non-interventionist security. What am I trying to say? I am saying that India will present a, an enviable geostrategic platform that will rule the world very soon. And that will make her neighbor China very uncomfortable. I am not going to be talking about America because for me, America is gradually approaching her twilight and I know for a fact that this will be replaced by a Sino-India hegemony that will take the world into a new world order and a new millennium from 2050. I am not writing of the United States of America, but I am saying that the way things are going, the world economic order 
will be detected by the contradictions that will emerge from the India-China relations, with China taking the lead and India trying to give China a good competition. Ladies and gentlemen, I am still saying without any fear of contradiction that India has come to stay as a very relevant country in global geostrategy. India has what it takes to give China a good run in terms of geostrategic relevance in the Indo-Pacific region. India as a world leading democratic country will remain a willing ally of the United States in trying as much as possible to checkmate the expansionism of China in the region. India has what it takes to moderate the excesses of Pakistan. India growth is so relevant and useful as a stabilizing democratic factor in the Indo-Pacific region. And on the basis of this reality, I know, ladies and gentlemen, that China will not fold her hands to watch India get away with all of these positive, you know, progress that is playing out for her. China will try as much as possible to manipulate as much as possible geostrategically the events in Pakistan as much as possible to serve as a destabilizing factor, you know, to the geostrategic interests of India. And I'm saying this as an African scholar, I'm, an, I'm not an Indian, uh, and I'm saying it at the height of objectivity so that this position will not be seen as a subjective one. I come from Africa, I come from Nigeria, and I'm watching these events from the African continent. And that is why students and scholars of geostrategy in the Indo-Pacific region are monitoring the events and the competition between China and India, and of course between India and Pakistan and America's interests from the geostrategic point of view and as it relates to us here in Nigeria. We are watching with keen interest and I know that the dynamics and the contradictions that all of these relations are throwing up will have a lot of consequences on the African continent. However, for today, I'm going to dwell essentially on the geostrategic relations between India and Pakistan and as it affects Africa and Nigeria, my country. Politically, India and Pakistan were British creation along religious lines with essentially the Hindu Chinese, I mean, uh, Hindu Indians in present day India and the Muslim Indians in present day Pakistan. That was a colonial creation and for whatever reason, the UK government thought that that was the best way to go as at 1947 and it has remained so for some time. Even though that probably was done to feed the geostrategic and diplomatic interest of the United Kingdom as at that time, that creation has also demarcated these two countries into not too friendly neighbors. And that is where some of these manipulations at the level of geostrategic interest come to play. And as we speak today, while India 
is relatively doing well socioeconomically and politically, Pakistan has been emerged in a lot of national and internal security issues created by the manipulations of some ethnic and political interests that had some internal and external correlations as causative factors. I don't want to bore our listeners with what led to the Talibanization of Pakistan, but we all know that a lot of intrigues coming from the external Western powers ended up to create these ugly scenarios. Beyond that, I will also say that as much as possible that there are a lot of frosty relations between India and Pakistan in terms of some boundary issues. And it has never been a very smooth one with military skirmishes from time to time. And of course, in the last decade, we have experienced series of terrorist incursions, you know, diffusing from Pakistan into India. And the level to which India has been able to manage that along the borders, the level to which India has been able to manage even the radicalization of Indian Muslims emanating essentially from some radical elements in Pakistan remains a matter of conjecture. But I make bold to say, ladies and gentlemen, that as we speak today, as an African, we salute the courage of India so far in managing internal security, in managing national security, and in trying to tame as much as possible, you know, a lot of terrorist, you know, and radical elements and non-state actors that are spilling into India across the border from Pakistan. I am not in any way maligning Pakistan as a nation, but I am saying that as a scholar from Africa, I know for a fact that a lot of radical elements are actually located in Pakistan and they are actually infiltrating into India and by extension they are also having a lot of their ideas infiltrating into the continent into the continent of Africa and by extension my country Nigeria. What am I trying to say? India and Pakistan, two countries that are of the same race, if you ask me, or sub-race as it were, but that have that are greatly divided geostrategically and, and, and politically, you know, right from you know the colonial days up on this moment, remain a very fragile case study. But I must commend India so far for trying to stabilize her own country while Pakistan is also trying to do her best as much as possible on their side, you know, to handle the effect of terrorist attacks ravaging the country. But be that as it may, between India and Pakistan, a ding-dong relationship has continued to persist. And I know that both governments have been trying as much as possible you know, to tame the growing conflagration between the border, uh, the, their borders and between a lot of radical elements that have the capacity to infiltrate both borders. I am not taking side, but I know that in terms of global radical ideas, you have a lot of radicalized Muslims on the side of Pakistan creating credible security threats in the Indo-Pacific region. 
And of course, I know that this threat also touches some highly Muslim countries like Bangladesh around there. I am not ignorant of the fact that radical Islamic ideas is really growing in the region. But my interest for today is to look at how India has been trying to manage as much as possible her frosty relationship with Pakistan and the Talibanization process, which to some extent is actually infiltrating the continent of Africa and of course by Nigeria. Let me also say that by way of commendation that India has tried so much and they've been trying to manage their relationship and try as much as possible to keep all these radical elements and non-state actors in Pakistan from causing grievous harm to the world's biggest democracy, which is India. Kudos to India, and I thank you for all that you have done as a government so far. Having said that, let me quickly say that the growing threat of the Talibanization of Pakistan has remained that of global concern. A lot of radical ideas have emerged from there, and I don't want to bore us about how it was created, but I do know that as we speak today, there are a lot of highly dangerous elements and non-state actors masquerading as Taliban in Pakistan. And they pose a risk, not just to the national security of Pakistan, but to a great extent to India, to the Indo-Pacific region, and to Africa, where I come from. What am I talking about? When terrorist organizations get sophisticated, part of their effort towards resilience is to try as much as possible to have cells all over the world. And these terrorist organizations have a global interconnectedness reaching out all the four corners of this world. As we speak today, there is a relationship, whether we like it or not, a potent relationship between the Taliban of Pakistan, Al-Qaeda as we have it today, ISIS as we have it today, Hezbollah as we have it today, to some extent Hamas as we have in the, in the land of Palestine. And if you come to the continent of Africa, there is a relationship, there is a network between the Taliban of Pakistan and Al-Shabaab operating in Somalia and in Kenya, with Boko Haram operating in my country, Nigeria, with Al-Qaeda operating in the Maghreb, in the north of Africa, with the Islamic State of West Africa operating in the Lake Chad region, and of course in Nigeria. So you can see that to a great extent, Africa is caught up in the web of the Talibanization agenda. And suffice to say that India has a role to continue to play in ensuring that as much as possible, part of her geostrategic manipulation is to try as much as possible to keep the activities of these Taliban in conjunction with Pakistan at bay and to moderate their activities so that the region can be at peace, the region can be stable, and by extension, their international network, as we have it in Africa, will also be attenuated. Right now, as we speak, my continent of about 
1.2 billion people is in great danger as a result of terrorist activities, which has strong network with Taliban of Pakistan. What am I trying to say, ladies and gentlemen? I am saying that as we speak, Africa is constantly under series of terrorist attacks, not just in Egypt, they are there in Libya, they are there in Mali, they are there in Niger, they are there in Mauritania, they are there in Tunisia, they are there in Algeria, they are there in Burkina Faso, they are there in Cote d'Ivoire, they are there in Nigeria, they are there in Cameroon, they are there in a lot of countries on the continent of Africa. I need to also mention that Al-Shabaab, which has strong ties with Taliban, are wreaking havoc in Somalia. They are also wreaking havoc in part of Kenya, and to some extent Eritrea. I need to also mention that Djibouti is not too free from their activities. The continent is in trouble, already facing the challenges of development and bad governance, and currently at the mercy of terrorist organizations all over the continent to worsen the geopolitical and economic development of the continent. I make bold to say that India has a very strong power in the India-Pacific region has to come to the rescue of Africa by collaborating constructively with Pakistan to a great extent to ensure that the activities of these Taliban are adequately moderated. Africa, at this level of development, cannot survive the onslaught of terrorist activities. Having said that, I also need to say that as we speak today, Nigeria is in serious trouble from 2009 up till today as we speak. Nigeria has lost billions of dollars in terms of human and material resources. Millions of people as internally displaced persons and refugees and tens and th of thousands of deaths caused by Boko Haram terrorists and Islamic State of West Africa and some elements of, of Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which have infiltrated into my country. We are battling with it. The war is very fierce as a result of the asymmetric warfare method adopted by these non-state actors and terrorist organizations. And we know that we need collaboration, not just with the African Union, which is in charge of the continent of Africa. We need collaboration with India, which is a very strong ally in the war against terrorism. We also need collaboration with Pakistan, which is battling you know, her own internal and external security threats arising from the activities of Taliban in that country. And we need to work together on what I refer to as a kind of African Indo-Pakistan security strategic plan so that in terms of intelligence gathering and management, Africa will have a potent intelligence sharing and management platform 
with India and with Pakistan in a way that we, we can jointly and proactively preempt attacks from Taliban, attacks from Al Shabaab, attacks from Al Qaeda in the Maghreb, attacks from ISIS in Africa, ISIS in West Africa, attacks from Boko Haram in Nigeria, attacks from ISIS in West Africa, and from all other non-state actors that draw inspiration and veritable networks from what is happening in Pakistan, which India has successfully so far have been able to moderate to a great extent, you know, on the basis of the excellent geostrategic manipulation and management that she has been able to do. That is not to say, however, that India has done that perfectly. I am proposing that as much as possible, India as a very strong and powerful country that I have seen with wonderful potentials that is capable to rule the world by 2050. I am suggesting that the government of India should try as much as possible to design a new geostrategic platform with strong allies like the United States of America, with the African Union to take care of the African Union, and to some extent, a collaborative platform with Pakistan. That way, we'll be able to achieve a peaceful world, we'll be able to achieve a peaceful India, we'll be able to achieve a peaceful Pakistan, a peaceful Africa and a peaceful Nigeria. Finally, let me thank the organizers once more for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you have given to me. Have a nice day. Have a wonderful deliberation. God bless India. God bless Pakistan. God bless Africa, and God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you, and thank you all for having me.